Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. As I promised, we are back with part two of our conversation about Nightmare Alley, the new movie from co-writer and director Guillermo del Toro. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out the episode we posted a couple of days ago, uh, that was my one-on-one -on -one sit down in-person interview with Guillermo. I hope you do. I had a blast talking with him. He's so spirited, so much fun, has so much to say. Uh, it's a good episode and I do hope you check it out. So we're back again today with part two of the conversation with the film's sound team. We have on the show Greg Chapman, the production sound mixer, Christian Cook, the re-recording mixer, Jill Purdy, the supervising sound editor, Nathan Robitaille, also the supervising sound editor, and Brad Zorn, the re-recording mixer. It's a good conversation filled with lots of good detail about how they accomplish the track on the film. And so I hope you enjoy the conversation. Before we dive in, I just wanna say, uh, this is our final podcast episode of 2021. And for those of you who have been uh, along on the ride with us this year, I really am just so grateful for the audience that we built up and the engagement that we've gotten. Uh, doing this show is just a great pleasure and I'm really thrilled with how the community has responded to it. And also just, uh, you know, how many great filmmakers we've been having on lately. It's been, it's been a, a lot of fun to have these conversations. And so I just want to express my gratitude uh, for that. We've got a lot of special stuff coming up next year. And so I hope to, uh, to see you all again in the new year. Uh, we're going to try something new in January. We're going to be focusing on gaming and sound in gaming for a few episodes. So I hope you come back and check that out. We've got lots of interesting stuff coming up in the new year. And of course, we're gonna be doing more conversations with filmmakers and sound people uh, about their work. So uh, I hope to see you all again in the new year. In the meantime, let's dive into Nightmare Alley. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation uh, about Nightmare Alley. This is a pretty amazing sounding film. Um, I think you, you might've heard me say, I got the chance to sit down with Guillermo in Los Angeles on Friday in person. And we had a, we had a nice long conversation. So this is actually going to be a two part episode. The first part I'm going to be talking is going to be my conversation with him. And then the, uh, the second episode, uh, will be our kind of round table conversation. So, um, I might, I might cross-examine you guys with what Guillermo said, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. It's very fitting for this film. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's so much great stuff to discuss, uh, in Nightmare Alley. Uh, I want to just start off, you know, with the very beginning of the movie. It's, I, I think there's so much going on to set mood and tone. You've got that great sequence right at the beginning of the film with Stan, uh, who is Bradley Cooper's character, although you don't necessarily know that yet. And there's a body and he sets a fire. And then suddenly you find yourself in the, in the carnival. And just, there's so much going on in that first kind of 10 minutes of the film. Uh, I'd love for you guys just to tell me kind of, uh, kind of what were the conversations with Guillermo about the sound design and the treatment of the mix in that first 10 minutes and what you felt like you had to accomplish from a storytelling standpoint. I remember there was a, they, they played with uh, the timing of the body drags for a while. We were going to have some body drags for black and like all of these things leading into the movie. Um, it changed form a lot. And I think that it was just really a matter of, of, of starting the movie with something that was a bit jarring and shocking and like, what are we, what are we looking at and what are we hearing and what, what's happening here? Because, you know, this is just, you do, you open up a movie with a guy dragging a body towards a hole no explanation. He burns the whole place down and then goes to the carnival. It's kind of a dark setup. <laughs> Absolutely. Nathan and Jill, um, obviously you worked with uh, Guillermo on uh, the previous film, uh, The Shape of Water. Um, what were the conversations that you ha had with Guillermo at the beginning of the process for the, the spotting session? At what point did, did, did you read the script before they go the, the, he went and shot the film or how did you, how did you first get involved with the project? I came on actually, um, he, he told me that, uh, he wanted me to join this one, uh, at the end of working on antlers, he was producing antlers, uh, with us. And, uh, yeah, he just told me he wanted me, he told me he wanted me on a movie that didn't have monsters in it. And that was music to my ears. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that kind of, that kind of turned into just me, 
you know, asking, asking miles to hook me up with someone, um, who could get me a script. And I started, uh, I started peeling through the script and, uh, it was, it was a pretty, uh, a pretty compelling script to read. Um, and then, yeah, it was just kind of a bit of a silence for a while while they, while they geared up and got ready to shoot. And, um, with, with Guillermo, um, it was sort of this way with shape of water as well. There's not really one spotting session where he lays it all out. He kind of trickle feeds scenes to you. And as you get those scenes, he spots them with you. And it's kind of cool because it reveals this, it reveals the movie in an almost an out of order uh, presentation. So, you know, a lot of the things that, that, that we're working on and designing are unspoiled by their placement in the timeline. Um, it's really only tethered by our memory of reading the script, which, I mean, if you read a script only once before you get started, it's easy to forget what order things are meant to happen in and s some context gets lost. Um, but sort of as we work on the movie, the movie starts revealing itself to us this way. Um, but the main, the main thing, I mean, if we're going to say sort of a general rule in the early spotting sessions, one of the things Guillermo said to us is like, it's really important that we emphasize the freedom in poverty at the carnival and the restriction and like that suffocating isolation in the wealthy back half of the city. Once, once they start to succeed and they go to the big city, that was kind of the big global bird's eye, um, note and so from there forward that would influence every choice that got made as we started doing sort of pre-design elements and you know s sourcing uh sourcing the bits and pieces that would eventually build the cacophony that was the the carnival and the copacabana and all these other beautifully shot scenes <laughs> So I guess um, my involvement uh, started a little, probably a little after Nathan's, but it, I got wind of it. Nathan was on Antlers at the time and I was on Scary Supervising, co-supervising Scary Stories. So we were kind of in similar veins on different shows. And that's when I got approached about um, working on Nightmare Alley. And my history with Guillermo goes back to, you know, cutting production on um, all four seasons of The Strain and then co-supervising Scary Stories and working um, primarily in ADR and some production on Shape of Water. So it was a, a logical pro progression with my availability and Nathan's as well. And um, my history with working with Nathan and Chris and Brad actually as well. So um, I came on a little later in the scene because uh, sound design took precedent um, for this movie in particular. And um, yeah. So how do you, so Nathan and Jill, how do you divide up the, the duties? Nathan, are you doing sound design and effects and Jill, are you handling dialogue or how, how does it work between the two of you? Nailed it. Yep. Dialogue ADR on my end and, and yeah, Nathan Rangles I, I basically design. take care of the, the sound effects design and um, I'm kind of the, the go between um, to communicate with Foley and just make sure that, that they know what's coming from Guillermo. Cause again, it was important that they hear, from him uh regarding those early notes like the 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 poverty and the wealth and all of those things needed to pollute everybody's minds and and sort of be ever present through the whole process i want to i want to come back to uh, something you just raised nathan in a minute but uh jill i wanted to uh, this you know this is your opportunity this is it's such a a rare uh treat for us to have uh, a production sound mixer join our conversation. I'm I'm, I'm glad that Greg Chapman is here uh, to join the conversation. So, th Jill, this is your this is your chance. How, how did Greg do? How are those production tracks? What did you have to work with on the show? Well, let me tell you. No, Greg was a godsend. I got to say, <clears throat> on this show, I mean, I I've said this so many times already, but it's it's a thankless job. It's it's one I wouldn't would, would never take on um, production sound mix mixing. But Greg had to deal with so many elements on this show, um, especially you know the exteriors uh, at the carnival and in Buffalo as well. And there were a lot of variables to deal with, which he handled exquisitely. And even though the material I had to work with was varying from take to take in so many different ways, there was so much material to work with and um, it all came together seamlessly in the end. And I, I can't thank Greg enough for that because there, 
in the hands of somebody else, I don't know how we would have fared, to be honest. Aw, thanks, Jill. Greg, tell us about uh, tell us about production. I understand that this was a very very cold shoot. Oh, it's funny. <clears throat> Just watching the film for the first time um, uh, two days ago, or was it yesterday? Um, watching the Buffalo stuff. Oh my God, it was so cold in Buffalo. Like some of the coldest I've ever shot anywhere. Like watching Stan walk up the steps past the uh, Salvation uh, Army box and running into the Lilith's building there was like one of the coldest, windiest places I've ever been in my life. It was like, it had to be like minus, I don't know, super, super cold. But it was, uh, you know, and all that stuff, like all the stuff at the um, uh, <clears throat> outside, uh, the end of the movie with um, uh, when Rooney comes and in the dress of the blood at Parkwood Estate, uh, that was all pretty cold. Uh, and it was all, it was all pretty, you know, we had moments of, uh, Guillermo likes a lot of atmosphere. So there was like fans and snow machines and, uh, just like lots of them all the time. And he wanted more and more and more, but then all of a sudden, sometimes he'd look over and say, you know, should we do this one without the fans? And, uh, yeah, let's and you'd be let's, like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's do one without the fans. And um, so I'm actually kind of curious how much of that stuff uh, you guys were able to use from that uh, Parkwood, all that snowy Parkwood stuff. I think it was all almost of it. all of it. Wow. It was all of it. We had some ad lines in there, but. Wow, that's great because it was so, some of it was so noisy, so windy, but that's cool. So what's your, what's your secret? Uh, Jill and, and Christian, how do you how do you take those noisy production tracks and dig that stuff out and make it salvageable? Well, Jill hands me the best tracks I've ever had, always, and uh, and always these little post-it notes which I love. And next time we do a film together, Jill, I'm going to save them all. I have some, <laughs> them. I, not from me. <laughs> no, but I, I have them, and it's you know I take pride in my post-its. So yeah, the production tracks were great. The the, the stuff at um, at Parkwood Estates with all the fans going, I couldn't believe there was so much like level and uh, to work a lot of level to work with, you know, uh, up the dialogue tracks. So. Well, part of that was also, you know, thanks to the, uh, our costume uh, designer as well. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, sometimes you get lucky and with wardrobe that kind of works for a, a nice uh, radio mic. And th this time we did, sometimes you don't. I'm I'm curious, what do you mean by that, Greg? Are you talking about costume design where you can hide a radio mic, or are you talking about about bustles that don't make too much noise? Or just what, uh, you, you know, sometimes sometimes you're just faced with like if imagine it's a winter scene and everybody's wearing like a zipped up uh, puffy down jacket, and where do you hide the radio mic? You know, it's got to be somewhere that doesn't sound very good, and you're just what are you going to do? You know, you can't change it and so uh, I've worked actually with Lewis before, the costume designer, and he's he's just a very, you know, in addition to being, you know, very creative and interesting guy, he's also very cooperative and team player guy. And he, he's always thinking a little bit, I think, about about us and what we have to do and, you know, make sure that we have a, an avenue to you know, hide our radio mics and make things work out. Were you predominantly leaning on radio mics or boom mics, or what was the what was the mixture on the film? Uh, you know, we always like to use the boom mic the most, but we never put ourselves in a position where we're we don't have a radio mic to go to, and uh, we like to you know cover our bases with as many nice sounding microphones as possible to make everything work. You know, never limit ourselves and. Uh, use what uh, combination of everything, depending on what's being thrown at us, how wide the shot is. And there's a lot of wide shots in this movie. And so we had to, you know, mix in a lot of, you know, and I had two amazing boom operators and uh, who were constantly like, it was a challenge, you know, like all these moving, moving uh, technocrane shots for the whole movie was, it was, they're beautiful shots, but they're, you know, it was like a, a constant dance of, uh, these guys with, you know, dodging all the lighting and making it all work and radio mics when it, we needed them and 
you know, like you do. Christian and Brad, uh, talk to me a little bit about the uh, the mix process and uh, w- were there temp mixes um, before? And then how did you guys, what was the kind of the pre to and final mix schedule and how involved was Guillermo through the process? Was he on the stage every day? No, I was just going to say, um, there was supposed to be a couple temp mixes and uh, um, before we started and then just... Uh, Things changed. <laughs> Schedules change, as we all know. And uh, we ended up uh, starting this, I believe it was May um, of this year. And uh, our first temp sort of turned into, it was a uh, build as a temp, but it's kind of, we built the foundations for our, uh, f- for what's there for the final. Um, and that was, I think that was six, six weeks I think that one was. Um, and then we came back again in October for a few weeks um, and just uh, and did the final final after they did a little bit of a recut and did their uh, did their screenings and everything. And uh, that's when we came back for two weeks and and did our our final. And uh, as far as I remember, for uh, for the first um, temp mix or mix that we did. That was the seven weeks. Guillermo was in LA. We were, we were in Toronto doing the thing. So we had, uh, we had, um, I think most days we'd have them on our, on the stage, uh, remotely. So, you know, we'd be talking to him on a little box (laughs) and turn around and that worked actually, it was difficult. It had its challenges, obviously. Um, you know, and but but we made it work. I'm kind of curious. How did you know what he was listening to? Was he on a dub stage in yeah, LA? Yeah, he was on a dub stage in Los Angeles, uh, and we were piping him the uh, and the Atmos. Was this because of was this because of COVID that you? Yeah, we was? were because um, because when I flew into Toronto because I'm in LA, uh, they had I had to quarantine for two weeks before I was even on the production. So I was there for, I think for ended up being seven or eight weeks. Um, and two of those was sitting by myself in a condo. (laughs) So, um, so that, that's one of the main reasons why we didn't have Guillermo. We had, uh, we had to have him remotely and he would, uh, he would every day we had him, he would come to the stage in LA and sit down and we'd have him on the computer all day and we'd be working together. It was actually worked out really flawless we had very few issues if i remember correctly with that with that setup we we yeah we piped him a a uh, a dolby atmos mix that he was listening to on the stage there and we just did corrections with him and 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 fixes and mixed with him that way and uh then in the next stage the covid protocols had changed by october and there was no more quarantining and all that so we had him uh on the stage practically the entire time, I think for, uh, for the final mix. Um, and, uh, which was, which was a lot easier having them, you know, to bounce things off of them in the room and obviously, (laughs) you know, so, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, they had challenges at the beginning, you know, it was, uh, but, but I think, uh, it worked out really well. The final, final mix was actually really cool. Um, experience because this is the first time he had a chance to sit with the whole team and listen in the same air as the rest of us. And so he actually made a point of um, booking a few days right at the start of the mix. It really foreign to me to not be on the stage during the beginning of the final, but it was just him and I in a room across town in a sound design suite, just playing through the whole movie making adjustments, updating things so that we were sort of on the same page. And that way, when we went into the theater, he knew what was on every track of on the sound design side of things. So if, if he's that familiar with what's happening in the track, what, I mean, what's happening in the, um, in, 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 on the mixing stage, I'm, I'm thinking about the back to our conversation. He, 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 he made a very funny comment about music versus sound design. And he called it like 40 year old marriage. If they don't want to be in the right in the same room if they don't uh, if they're not having a good time, you know, if they're not in the right mood. So is that sort of like is that the tango that he's kind of kind of teasing out on on the on the mixing stage? Sort of. Yeah, that's such a good analogy. Yeah, sort of. Like I I don't know. Like I I I think Brad put it best. Like the when when uh, Nathan Johnson's score showed up, we were used to a lot of temp scores. 
and it was it was a revelation to us. And so a lot of that I think was just sort of Guillermo. He heard all these tracks. He knew how they were going to sound. He'd heard all of our tracks. He knew how those were going to sound, and he was ready to put them together. He was kind of guiding us. You know, the, the, it's it's kind of like being uh, blindfolded and guided through a maze, right? He's guiding us along the way, knowing the whole time what we might bump into with the music because he's familiar with what's coming. But when it showed up, I remember Bla- Brad, you looked at me and you're like, this is like a clinic on how much music can change a film because like it really was, the music was unbelievable. It just felt like it totally redefined so many scenes for us. And it just, it, yeah, it blew the doors off. And did that happen during the temp mix or was the, did the music come in later or when did that actually, when did it show up and have such an impact on your process? Uh, we didn't see the final music until the final mix in October. Before that, it was, uh, it was temp score and, and all that sort of stuff. So it was, uh, it was, it was, you know, we did our best and that's why I believe they called it the first mix we had was the temp final <laughs> because we, we didn't have the final score yet. And, uh, and once that, you know, and it's temp music, it's never going to, you know, it's going to be different. And once we kind of put it in there, it was like, it's like, all right, now I can, I can see, you know, it's like, this really defines how a movie can change with the right score and just how the feeling and everything and, and how much it brings to the table, you know, it's like, because we've heard it so long with this one way. And then to hear it with that was just wow, it feels complete now. It feels, it feels like, like the movie it's supposed to be. So I guess in his analogy, I guess Guillermo is the marriage counselor and <laughs> the sound effects and the music aren't allowed to see each other for several months while he works on each of us individually. And then he reintroduces us and we fall back in love. It's great. Exactly. And, it's exactly and there are times when you were fighting. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. great that's great um guillermo, guillermo talked a little bit about how how he used dolby atmos uh in the music to create space it's not about how many times you use the the overhead channels as much as when you need them you have them and how you can uh distribute the the dynamics of the sound on the surrounds and i like to say look put it in the fr- in front left surround but don't don't give me the rest of the of that side, uh, blah blah blah. And you can pinpoint the music and the and the even the, even the way you you make a scene either happening to them or to us in the theater, and that's a big difference. I think with Atmos, you say we are entering the fun house. If you mix it to the front, he is entering the fun house. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that part of the process and how you used Atmos with the with the music track? Yeah, well, we would pull it back into the room a little bit more and put it up a little higher so the dialogue could sit up front uh, in center center screen. That's about it. Really. <laughs> it's, it's, Keep it simple. <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> well, I'm 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 interested because obviously. You, you've all worked, um, I think, Greg, with the exception of you, but you've, you've worked with Guillermo on multiple projects. You were on The Shape of Water. How was this? How was this film different for you? Has has Guillermo's approach to sound design and the mix evolved over time, or um, you know, how, what you know, what's the the main differences between the process of working on Nightmare Alley versus Shape of Water? Two years, two years to overthink every single sound that 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 we put on the track um yeah because like we before before covid was a thing at all we were kind of getting getting started i mean greg can speak to this all of the back half of the movie was shot prior to covid um and so like we were we were really building that world and and really invested in it and then all of a sudden this virus came out and they shut things down and you know we had time to think about it. And when we came back, it was like fresh eyes, fresh ears, new movie, first half of the movie, totally different movie, right? Like the carnival is so different from, from, from Buffalo that, you know, COVID COVID played a role. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest difference in my experience in this movie. I don't know if you guys have another answer. Uh, Well, we were never involved through COVID. So it was like for us, you know, just working with Guillermo, um, you know, we, we had our, our first taste working with him, obviously with, uh, with shape of water and, uh, and 
discovering how in tune he is with, with the whole sound process and, and he remembers, he remembers everything. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're mixing something and something's not there all of a sudden. He's like, where'd that go? You know? So it, he, he's just, he's very in tune with the track and he, and he, and, and he uses it as much as he uses pitcher. And it's nice to have, to work with a director like that. And, you know, shape of water was a, a new learning experience for all of us, you know, working with him on a feature film for the first time. And then, you know, most of it, I, we, we had the chance to work with him again as a producer on antlers, uh, which was a different experience, getting a little more familiar. And then on this, uh, on, on nightmare alley, it was, uh, I think it, it, we had a, we had a more relaxed Guillermo cause we were, we were, he was comfortable with us. We were more comfortable with him. We knew what to expect from him. And it, uh, we, we had a lot of fun in the, in the, in the dub stage. And it was, uh, I, I think it was a little more relaxed environment this time. Here's what I'm curious about because like, so Jill and I both worked on the strain, but Greg, I think you also worked on the strain. Did you not? I did. Yeah. And so you're, you have the benefit of having the broadest span of time between the first, the, the last time you worked with them and this time, is there a difference that you noticed? <clears throat> Not really. I mean, um, he's uh, the same guy with extreme attention to detail and uh, passionate and uh, same guy. Yeah. So win uh, winning two Academy Awards didn't, didn't make him more mellow in his approach, I think. <laughs> I don't think so. No. <laughs> Greg, I want to follow up with something. I want to follow up on something that Nathan said. I'm just intrigued by this. So you were talking about Buffalo. So that's the back half of the film, um, which is the you know the 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 club and then the psychotherapy office and then uh, Grendel's lair at the end. So what I I just uh, gathered from what um, Nathan said was that all those scenes were shot pre-COVID, and then you shut down and came back and shot the carnival sequence. Originally, we originally we're going to shoot all the carnival stuff first, and uh, and then it uh, it got delayed. Is that right? Is that what happened? And then we came. We we started with the um all the interiors, all the stuff in the studio, and then we got shut down, and had a you know a long six month. Uh, pause and then came back and did all the carnival. So originally the carnival was supposed to be the first part of the, the film, but uh, so it got, everything got switched around for everybody. And it was, I bet if there's a delay, they probably, you probably just got delayed off the weather that was good enough to shoot outdoors. It was, uh, you know, I don't know what the reason for the delay was, but originally we were supposed, yeah, we were supposed to, you know, we were starting with the, it was going to start in the fall with the, the carnival. And then, uh, it got delayed and COVID and, uh, and for us, it was, uh, you know, like when you're first meeting everybody on the film and first starting, it was, uh, it was a little, uh, you know, kind of a boom of, uh, meeting everybody and bang, here we go. And it was, uh, well, you know, a little bit nervous, the beginning of everything, but all these interior and all these, uh, sets and all, you know, really, you know, great actors and great performances and uh, and for us it was like a little shocking too because like sound wise all these interior spaces were kind of harder hard to work in they were hard um sounding things and they looked that way like you guys were saying earlier about how he wanted all that stuff to be all the buffalo stuff to be uh you know not friendly and in the end it was kind of like not super sound friendly either it was like um the state before every take the floors would be um uh wet down all the interior floors so they're beautiful shining but it was like for us it was like ah uh you know they became really squeaky and uh the, just all the hard surfaces were really you know it was a tough tougher sound ambience to start to start working with and when we came back uh, into the carnival, the carnival was beautiful. Like the sound was, and it was, it, you know, just kind of naturally fit in with the, uh, uh, the, you know, what he wanted from the film too, which was that to be all kind of easy going and relaxed. It was all, the sound was, was just kind of naturally beautiful sound there. It was all these beautiful surfaces and uh, nice flappy tents and straw ground and uh, 
like that. The tents do the tents do flap quite a bit in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, they were a character almost. Yeah, Nathan gave me lots of tracks yeah. that were uh, tent. <laughs> We've got uh, we've got some good clips to show from the uh, the the carnival sequence. Just about that, the sound design of the carnival bit, you, you were talking about the difference between the carnival versus the rest of the film. And, and there is a very clean break in sort of the kind of the visual aesthetic of the film. How does the sound design and the mix match that kind of break in the visual aesthetic? What were you trying to do thematically from a sound design standpoint with the carnival sequences versus the rest of the film? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it was mostly just um, keeping things airy at the carnival. Like, like Greg just said, like we had these tents that were like Guillermo called it breathing and they, they very much felt like they were breathing. I, I remember I was sitting there, I got an email from Cam, the picture editor, and it was just a track that, that these guys had recorded on set and he sent it to me. He said, you need to listen to these tents. And I listened to them. We were like, okay, we're recording those. And so me and Dishan Naidu went to set and with like stereo rigs so we could get, and, and I think we even had, uh, I think we even had an ambisonic uh, set up too just to like set things up and sit in these tents. And I mean, like on a non windy day, it's windy there. It's crazy how much those tents react to the, just the, the, the space around them. And so we were able to record a lot of these, like these beautiful sounding breathing tents and all the rides, the games, like all the, all the stuff that they had at the carnival, we were able to record them in open air. And that was a big thing in the first half of the movie, everything was open air. Everything could breathe. There was freedom. There's poverty. The carnies have nothing, but they have freedom. Once we go to the city, all of a sudden, every time you cross the threshold of a door, you hear a suction seal behind you on the door. You're isolated. You can't hear what's outside. Everything is like an, a, a chamber, a, a, an airless tomb. You're supposed to feel like you're in a vacuum and the world is supposed to kind of come down and collapse in on you. And Brad did a ton of great work limiting how much he would expand out into the overheads and things like that once we got to the city, just to sort of make the world feel a little bit smaller once we were wealthy. Yeah, we purposely went along like all the all the carnival stuff is, you know, with all the tent flapping and everything we have, you know, we're using the surrounds a lot. We're using the overheads quite a bit in the in the carnival and the height and uh, just being like making this really big, airy, you know, rich environment. And then um, everything in the city is like the complete opposite. We kind of collapsed everything a little bit pulled stuff in, you know, everything is very cold. You notice the winds in the, in the Dr. Ritter's office and, you know, all that. And, you know, it's always cold and it's always feels a little claustrophobic. And we tried to, to do that purposely and use that most to kind of make that difference and, and make it feel very claustrophobic. It also extends, it also extends into the specs and the Foley as well, because at the carnival, we wanted to make sure things sounded a little ill fitting, you know, shoes were looser, you know, there would be a lace flapping around as you walked around It's softer leather, you'd hear creaky floorboards and rickety doors and, you know, kind of busted cars, you go to the city and like the crystal glassware in Lilith's office sings to you. It's this really concise singular well-crafted piece or her shoes are like daggers on the marble floor just click click just snapping as she walks around nothing doesn't fit right the shoes are tight the you know the status has been elevated because nothing is really old it's all it's all new these are wealthy people they can afford that you know crisp roist and touch tip lighter and things like that you know I'm glad you brought that up because Guillermo talked about this point. Um, he made a he made a comment. I think something to the effect of like he's really allergic to bad foley or, or foley that is wrong. And if you uh, like, I, we went and I said, I want the Lilith crystal when she drinks has to be crystal. You, you, I, I hear when it's glass. What difference does it make? All the difference in the world. The scene where she drinks and then kisses him. I use the sound of the crystal, the little 
the little uh, le- the head tail end of that frequency. And that's my score. That's my score, really. Yeah, and it's funny that he calls himself allergic to bad foley when the direction we got for a lot of the wealthy shoes in the back half of the movie were... I almost want it to sound like bad Foley. He wanted everything to sound really clicky. He said, whatever you're doing for the female shoes, do that for the men's shoes and then make the female shoes even brighter. He wanted it to have that real sort of classic black and white feel, right? It, it, because it's true. Those movies, they have a, the Foley has a feel to it that by today's modern standards is almost bad. But when done intentionally and with purpose, it really fits the bill. But that's funny. That it's funny. I like that he said he's he's almost allergic to bad foley. <laughs> he didn't get any of that in this movie. You brought up Doctor Ritter's office, and I want to talk about that sequence. We've got a we've got a clip uh, from the first time that Stan is in there with her, and uh, she turns on the recording system, and they start to have a conversation. I think I'll just sit if that's okay. We can go much deeper if you do. Why don't we just start with sitting? When I offered you a drink, you said you never drank. Because I don't. Uh, Brad, you mentioned a little bit about sort of the, the wind in that in, environment. I, I love the sound design of that space and how, you know, sonically you treat it. Can you talk about uh, just sort of, you know, the philosophy of that space and what it says about her as a character? Yeah, we just, uh, that scene uh, is one of my favorite scenes. It ended up like so, so amazing. Like the, the amount of tension that is, that is relayed in that scene from, from Nathan's sound design, you know, um, that was a little bit like, it, it took a little while to get there. We had, we had, that was one of those moments where it's like, do we do music? Do we do sound effects for the scene? And, and that went on for a little while. We tried both. We tried, you know, and, uh, I, I'm happy that, that, you know, at that moment, we had sound design kind of like one at that moment. And, and Guillermo let us, you know, let us take the lead on that and uh, create this tension. And I love the way the sound design it gets to a point where during the whole interrogation or not interrogation, but interview, there's like this, this tension underneath with the sound design. And it's kind of like always gets to this point where you think, oh, my God, it's going to take and it's just sort of dissipates for a little bit and then the tension rises again and you feel like it gets to that point i feel like it's almost okay we're going too far and then just as you think it's going too far it kind of releases a little bit and it's just never ending relentless you know tension through that scene and and kate and bradley like their acting in that scene i think is the best in the entire movie um (laughs) and uh but it was just, uh, you know, little things that added to that, you know, like we have all the wind sort of like muted wind in, in from the window that they're right beside and the, and the burning of the cigarettes and, and all these little detail pieces that, that, that make that entire scene. And, and then at that moment where sort of he has her, all that stuff disappears except for the wind and you hear the wind and nothing else. The fire's gone and all that until he kind of snaps out of it and gets, you know, and then all the, the world sort of comes back and we're taken out of his head. And, uh, I think it's just, uh, that, that scene just blows me away. It was interesting through the subtraction of elements that got, uh, layered in as we build the scene. Um, yeah, like Brad says, it builds up and up and up until you realize, Oh, Oh no. Lilith has like weapons grade mentalism. She's a doctor. She can do this for real. And that's when everything falls out from underneath you. And it was just the coolest opportunity to just suck everything out of the room and go inside of Stan's head. <laughs> and, and you realize, oh, we're in trouble here. <laughs> I note that you use that word subtraction. Um, Guillermo used that word quite a bit when we were, when we were talking. He seemed to, he, he, he really enjoyed, um, talking about the process of experimenting with how specific and how quiet you could make the film um, and taking out as much as possible and, and stripping things back. I came up with a neat little line years ago, and I, <laughs> and I, this is the first time I admit that I invented it. I always say, like they say, no, I say, uh, silence is 10 tracks. You know, I always say, well, when you hear silence, you're really mixing 10 tracks. 
a little distant uh, car, a little uh, folly, a little, you know. But in this movie, we actually, one of the things that is the bravest to use is no tracks, and or very few. And in the dreams, we went into an abstract space by subtracting rather than expanding. So we didn't go into a lot of, rather a silence, you know? And, and we learned to go a little more naked in certain moments to emphasize them. So abstraction not only means to take something that sounds real and make it expressive in a non-realistic way, but that is very expressive, but also means subtracting. And of course, one of the things I think, you know, Jill and Christian, that puts a lot of pressure on on the dialogue, right? Because oftentimes you don't have much to hide behind. You're just, the dialogue is just right out there. And that must've been very challenging for you. It was in some of those things. Yeah. In that office, I remember doing, I was mod cutting because there was a lot of stuff going on. So it was, and I would find tone that I could fill that was just crystal clean and pretty silent uh, just to fill in the space and give it a little bit of, a little bit of life, but not impede the dialogue. Cause it was, yeah, that was, um, that was a bit challenging, but I was happy with the end end result. For sure. Uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, Grendel's estate and the, the, the treatment of sound in that particular uh, spot. We've got a clip of the lie detector test uh, that Stan takes. As briefly as you can, are you a true medium? Yes, I am. Can you read minds? Yes, I can. Under the right circumstances. Brief. Keep your answers brief. Grendel's house was so not what I was expecting of that character, the kind of the environment for him to be in. And when I talked with Guillermo, he spoke about sort of, uh, you know, that the, the, the production design of that space allowed Richard Jenkins to go in a very different direction with his you know, performance as the character because the space and the production design was doing a lot of heavy lifting that told you a lot about who he was. One of the mandates I give is we're not creating eye candy, we're creating eye protein. And it should be nutritious. It should tell you something about the character. It should immerse you in a motif. It should give you, um, for example, when you want to introduce a character like Grindel, you introduce him through a factory that is inhumanly big, cold, precise, uh, aloof, and almost aggressive. And then he's sitting down pleasantly in a little chair. And he's very agreeable. He says, hey, give me your jacket. And he falls, thank you for coming to see me. He can be that because the set is already doing some of the heavy lifting. I'm curious, from a sound design perspective, were you playing against the visuals in that space or, or what was the approach to the sound design and the mix in, in Grendel's lair? That was one where we just kind of followed their lead, to be honest. I think that's that. this is one of the things I noticed that Guillermo's really good at doing is telling story without wasting any frames on it. He just sort of like, he sets a scene and lets the audience invest in what they believe that should mean for that character. And uh, yeah, he doesn't need to waste any time in the cut telling you who, who Grindel is because you can see who Grindel is. So in a lot of ways, you know, not really via addition or subtraction. It was really, you know, just what I was laying up was just honoring what's on the screen, you know? Um, and, and the same thing with Dash, the, the sound effects editor who was working with me. Um, that one kind of comes down more to the dance between Christian and Brad with the, between music and, and sound effects and how they would play that sort of stuff. Yeah. I just sort of approached that. Like, uh, yeah, it was, we did do a lot of, uh, some traction on that scene, like from, from what we originally had. And, uh, and I think it was the, uh, the right thing to do. I think I remember you sparsing it out, like getting rid of birds and stuff like that, right? Oh, I got rid of all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it was like, yeah, everything at, at his house is like, there's no there's no life. There's nothing, you know, it's just wind and loneliness, you know? <laughs> it's like, and, uh, but like even with the, with the uh, lie detector, it was, uh, it's all about rhythm. Gamera wanted to hear the rhythm of that lie detector and the, and, and it was the ever present like needle scraping was constantly like it was like his heartbeat for the whole 
for the whole scene. You know, he likes he likes to to set a scene to set it with rhythm to have some sort of yeah heartbeat throughout the entire scene, and that's what that uh, lie detector came. Yeah, the lie detector was a uh, that was that was its own sort of. Um its own sort of thing at Grindle Industries when we go into the big room. That was another one of those uh, the, those sort of locations where it was clear, like, marble has to be marble, wealth has to be wealth. This cannot be mistaken for anything other than a very rich man with deep pockets and, and you know, endless resources. And that polygraph machine was kind of an extension of that. Um, that one... That one took some trial and error to to peg down. Um, actually, the the bulk of the meat of that um, of that device kind of got nailed down early on. But it was it's, it's an interesting thread that followed the evolution of this movie to sort of sew that scene up and and put it together. Because in the beginning, we were talking about playing things like beeps. And there was a very, uh, I would say, based on what the movie is now, overbuilt sound design sequence surrounding that whole room. Um, but yeah, like Brad said, I mean, I suppose if we're, if we're taking into account the whole process of the build of this movie, there, there was actually a ton of subtraction that happened on that specific scene. Because like we were pairing things back. We replaced the beeps with buzzes. We tried just subtracting and subtracting and subtracting until we got to the point where, okay, we want to hear a physical relay clicking on that machine. And then the only other cue the audience is going to have is the erratic rhythm of those needles scratching on the paper. And so then it kind of became all about those needles, those damn needles. <laughs> we had to find needles that could just keep a rhythm through that whole scene and keep like a metronomic pace going so that when he did tell a lie that the the machine was calling him out on you could hear it and we didn't have to do a, like ding eh, like we didn't have to do anything too leading you know um but yeah it, yeah that 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 did take some time to to get around to the lie detector was really hard to pin because if you make it too active it becomes a toy we tried a lot of tricks that had, had worked in the past and they didn't work here so we sound designed it really carefully. And finding something like the light, the green for right and red for wrong, we tried, eh. then we tried a relay. Then we tried, and then we said, eh. leave it in silence. Because everything sounded like a, you know, they were playing Jeopardy. One little interesting aside about that was that we filmed, that was the scene we were filming when on that day on March 12th or whatever it is, where like we worked till lunch doing like the wide establishing part of that. And at lunch, there was an, a meeting and an announcement that we're done. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. And we came back to that scene like six months later. I wanted to ask you about, uh, there's some gruesome stuff in this film and uh, striking the balance. And I love Bruno's punches. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, it's, you know, what was the process of experimenting and finding just how far to go and where to pull back and how far was too far? And can you go too far for gear? Uh, no, you can't <laughs> go too far for gear. No, <laughs> there is. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, I remember the first thing Nathan, Nathan talked to me about was like, all right, everything in Bruno has to sound like 50 pounds of meat. So, <laughs> it was like, so you can go ahead Nathan, with that. I just, that's the, the, yeah, one of the first things we discussed. <laughs> there's a there's a, a funny backstory about about those punches because uh, everything went into lockdown and everybody who was on any film set who had gotten to a stage where they had footage in the can now had to set up remote editing suites. Um, they they set up Evercast and that's where you know so basically the picture editor was juggling sorting out how to run Ever Evercast while keeping the picture edit moving forward. And so there wasn't a lot of time for sort of s extraneous troubleshooting for, for things like, you know, sound. So he, for a while, they were unable to get Guillermo's headphones to work on his end. So he would be calling in, they'd be working on the picture edit uh, over laptop speakers, which is fine. 
but then enter me trying to present this work that I made on reasonably good speakers and, you know, full frequency, big builds. And I'm sending them to cam. They go into the avid, get turned down 10 dB to clear dialogue. And then they get streamed to Guillermo, who's listening on laptop speakers because we couldn't figure out how to get his headphones working. And so it became this whole process of having to like build a scene, listen to it on a laptop, come back to the computer and make adjustments, go back to the laptop. And probably the most painful experience in all of that was the big Bruno punch. That bit when he first just slugs Stan in the face and Stan just crumbles because we had basically found ways. It was an interesting challenge. Like we had to find ways to convey weight, impact, velocity, and just sort of grandeur with out leaning on base in the during that phase because we didn't have that we couldn't we couldn't share that with Guillermo he, we just couldn't make his headphones work i got guns to work i got like cars to work man and then and then all of a sudden like we finally get to this point i think i i started doing hosting some of these and like okay we got to we got to solve this so we finally got we got his headphones up and running and I had taken a break from that punch because you listen to a punch on loop and you start going crazy, right? I'd left the punch alone for a while and we just happened to be playing through that scene to just audition some sound design stuff from Paul Davies and we roll past the punch and he's like, the punch sounds great. <laughs> I was just like, awesome. That's great news. <laughs> All of a sudden the note went away because he heard the full frequency of the punch. <laughs> I think he knew, he knew, he knew that it was there. He just, I knew I, he, he knows. Yeah. When, when it's time to push, you know, and, and he saw some success with other transient elements that needed to convey bass. I just remember thinking while I was building all those things that I knew he could only hear on, on laptop speakers, man, when he hears this full frequency is going to blow his socks off, you know, and it, and it, and it did. So there's a, that's just a weird aside on the, on the Bruno punch. That's great. <clears throat> that must've been, that must've been so frustrating not having him not a, a not knowing what he was listening on or what state it was going to be in. And yeah, it must've been a great relief to finally get in the same space with him in place. Oh my God. Yeah. Or just, just to get him in headphones, right? Like once, cause it's not like he, he wanted to hear it. He just would plug in the headphones and nothing was coming through them. And so, you know, we just, we had to work with what we had, you know, we were, it was all kind of troubleshooting while we're trying to keep this thing moving forward. So one of the things I noticed right from the very beginning of the film is that um, Guillermo is using flashbacks uh, really kind of throughout the film. And they're, they start at the very beginning and they're doing really interesting things. Can you talk about the approach to the flashbacks from a sound perspective and how you built those and sort of how they fit into the rest of the film? So oftentimes when we cut into them, this is one of those things that in the beginning I was seeing sort of snippets of them. I would see just a shot of fire going in reverse, burning up a corpse. And that would be used as, as a, a little toy, just, just inspiration, give us something crazy. And in the beginning, those flashbacks were all being hit really hard with really sibilant, vibrant, ripping fire and like bright, wide open sounds. But as we got to know the movie and what we were trying to do with those, those flashbacks, and we started seeing things in context, it became pretty clear that we needed to back off and kind of do something that was a little off center, you know, taking the fire, mixing it with a bit of water, t distorting it a bit, rolling it off and just making it sound in the room, but maybe uh, suppressed because that just sort of felt like a, an opportunity to not crowd the audience's ears and let them think about what's happening. And I think that was really important because we kept referring to them as flashbacks, but once we kind of started turning things down, it made it a little bit more easier to notice that, you know, we see fire, we see Stan on the bedside with his dad. He opens the window, a gust of frozen wind comes in. He rips the covers off of his dad and then presumably sits down to watch his father die from exposure from the elements. But in the beginning of the movie, he lights the cabin on fire and walks away in the middle of summer. So is this a flashback or is it a fantasy? Is this a callback to Pete's lesson about mentalism. You know, he wants to be loved by that man, but he hates that man, a death, a wish of death, right? Did he kill him? Did he wish he killed him? And that's another one of those opportunities that Guillermo took to let the audience invest something in this character because they have to decide for themselves what they think is happening there. 
what kind of man Stan is. And I think that's a good way to suck them in, which is great. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk to us about Nightmare Alley. I really enjoyed this film. Greg, Brad, Jill, Christian, Nathan. Uh, it's fantastic work, really remarkable. Congratulations on a, another great track for Guillermo del Toro. Thank you. I really appreciate you talking to us. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Yeah. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks once again to Nathan, Jill, Christian, Brad, and Greg for joining us for this conversation about Nightmare Alley. I hope you enjoyed it. Go see this movie. See it in a theater. It is fantastic. has a great track. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode and the conversation that we had previously with Guillermo del Toro as much as I had recording these episodes. So as I mentioned in the intro, I'm excited to announce something that we've never done on the podcast before. Uh, for the month of January, we're going to be focusing on gaming. As I'm sure most of you know, there is some incredible work being done right now in terms of sound and music for gaming. Uh, and a lot of titles are being released in Dolby Atmos. So we've decided to team up with my colleagues in the gaming department at Dolby for a number of conversations about sound and music in games. And I hope that you'll join us again for that uh, in January. First up, we're gonna be talking about Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. So join us on January 4th uh, for that episode. It's a conversation with the sound and music team from Eidos Montreal, uh, who just released this epic new video game. Uh, until then, thank you again for joining us. This is Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening. <laughs>